I go. Thank you, Mauro, for your kind invita invitation and presentation. So I'm going to talk about NCA resistance and relevance for clinical use. Let me start by looking into the mechanisms of NCI resistance. So as you know, integrase inhibitors inhibit an essential step in HIV replication within the cell, which is integration of proviral DNA into the host genomic uh, DNA. Uh, that is done through a very specific mechanism that involves a uh, transesterification reaction with a direct nucleophil nucleophilic attack, the three prime group of the, of the DNA so that um, the HIV uh, genome is inserted into, into the host uh, genome, usually near active uh, genes. The integrase has three domains, an N-terminal domain, which is involved in zinc binding and multimerization, a catalytic core domain, uh, where uh, uh, we have a DDE motif that is actually um, linked to, to magnesium uh, uh, cations uh, that actually induce this uh, ester uh, reaction in a C-terminal domain. So most resistance mutations occur in the catalytic core domain. All INSTIs have a similar structure, so they can be different, but they share two, two uh, moieties. Uh, in, 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 in purple, you can see a hydrophobic benzyl moiety that varies into a highly hydrophobic pocket near the active site. And uh, then in red, a chelating triad that binds to the two magnesium ions in a rather high hydrophilic region. These two regions are pretty much very similar to, to the different INSTIs and everything in between uh, changes. Here you can see a diagram uh, with uh, an INSTI uh, where you can see this benzyl moiety and also there is uh, other moiety that's actually binding uh, to the active site of magnesium ions. This uh, binding leads to a functional impairment of integrase. Uh, resistance mutations uh, occur, most resistance mutations I, I was saying occur in the catalytic core. Here on the right hand side, you see the main resistance mutations summarized for the different STI, uh, STIs summarized by the Stanford uh, database. So, one characteristic is that they are shared among the different STIs. So, uh, in this uh, three dimension, representation of an integrase catalytic uh, side. You can see how on the left-hand side, you can see how raltegravir is binding to the catalytic side. And in the right-hand side, how alvitegravir is binding to the catalytic side. The two molecules are very similar. And what you can see around these molecules in yellow are the main resistance mutations or the main sites that are involved in STI resistance, namely N155, uh, 148, 140, 92, and, and here the, we are not representing uh, 143, which is another site that it's very, very important. So you can see that both uh, uh, drugs bind very closely to these uh, resistance sites. This other uh, molecular structure here compares dolutegravir in green, the dolutegravir molecule with the raltegravir molecule. Right. So you can see how the two molecules are actually have a moiety that is actually sequestering uh, the two magnesium ions, but they are slightly different in their uh, structure so that dilutegravir is uh, pretty more, more uh, flexible and it's more able to bind into the INSTI catalytic site, even in the presence of resistance mutations and something similar also occurs for dictegravir. The way these different uh, uh, NCTIs have been improved has been by making successive uh, changes in the delta ring in this uh, benzyl moiety, but also in the alpha ring, so that if on purpose, they have become more and more uh, efficient and, and have been able to bind into the catalytic site for longer, uh, allowing us to uh, inhibit viruses that are resistant to the first generation NCTIs. As a consequence, you can see here uh, the fold change against different uh, single mutants, double mutants, and also uh, multiple mutants, which uh, are uh, resistant to lv and in blue and raltegravir in, in, in yellow. And what you can see here is that in uh, such uh, mutants can be inhibited 
by W Tegravir in gray or big Tegravir in green. So an interesting uh, factor of dolutegravir and, 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 and bitegravir also is that tenofovir, XTC, and also INSTI resistance is very rare in dolutegravir failures, and, and, that's, but, and also in, in, in bitegravir failures. And that is uh, also that is a major reason why we're using these drugs nowadays. When uh, many years ago we were using brotegravir, patients used to fail through at least three different pathways. One characterized by a major mutation, like 155H, 148, 143, in addition to additional uh, secondary mutations that would uh, sequentially increase um, uh, resistance and, and reduce susceptibility to these drugs. And it seemed that the virus would be choosing one way, or one pathway or, or another. In very early studies from both um, uh, Carlo Federico's uh, Pernos group and also ourselves, we were able to see this is a phylogenetic tree uh, in both cases of a patient who failed Raltegravir resistance mutation. And what you can see here, uh, Raltegravir resistance, and what you can see here was that in yellow, for example, you have 148R mutants emerging during virological failure. And all these mutants were actually stemming out from a pre existing minority 148R uh, mutant that was present at baseline, even before this patient ever uh, was exposed uh, to Raltegravir. So pre existing Raltegravir resistant mutants uh, uh, exist and, and they are there. And if we use NSTIs, um, uh, we, we don't we use instead with low genetic barrier with alongside uh, low genetic barrier regimens. This can happen. We just need these uh, pre existing mutants to emerge. In this case, these were 148R mutants, and in green, you could see you can see 155H mutants also emerging from a pre existing, pre -existing variant. Um, however, that, that, that was early times in, in, in STIs. What the different clinical trials, there had been a lot of clinical trials uh, testing uh, dolutegravir in, in, in black, but also big tegravir in, in red. And what you can see, and this is a, a summary of, of a lot of clinical trials, both in antiretroviral naive, but also a switch uh, therapy. And, and despite that the efficacy was different for the different uh, INSTIs compared with the different compares, comparators, one common characteristic was that uh, INSTI resistance was not uh, selected, uh, was never selected except for one patient um, uh, in virological failures, but also in uh, tenofovir and FTC or TXF, FTC resistance was also not, uh, not selected. So suggesting that these drugs uh, even when they fail, they're not uh, associated with significant amounts of, of resistance. Uh, so that's really uh, something that uh, really provides a lot of uh, hope uh, and, and it's very important for clinical use. However, in this uh, report in the New England Journal of Medicine published in two, 2019, there are anecdotal cases where in certain situations, and this patient was exposed to a regimen, a regimen with uh, rifampin, tambotol, uh, and, and another uh, um, anti-tuberculosis, tuberculostatic drugs. This patient actually developed uh, resistance mutations, particularly to 63K and, and J118R mutation alongside one 4 v during virological failure to a triple drug uh, therapy with dolutegravir. So in, in other words, resistance can emerge if we are not careful enough. Resistance can emerge even to dolutegravir, particularly in the presence of significant interactions or particular situations. However, this is not uh, frequent at, at all. And most clinical trials which have been uh, performed show no emergence of resistance. Uh, doing STIs after virological failure. Uh, another question would be, is there pre-existing STI resistance? And so to what extent should we worry about pre-existing STI resistance? So therefore, do we have to sequence the in integrase in all patients before on in patients before giving them STIs? 
there have been tons of studies in different parts of the world. I will just summarize two studies that were performed and were recently published in a Journal of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. Both studies are from Spain. And, and in the first study by Marta Alvarez and colleagues and Federico Garcia, where you can see they evaluated more than 1,000 patients from Spain during the period from 2012 to 2017. And essentially, there was no pre-existing uh, resistance, very low amounts, very infrequent uh, detection of uh, INSTI mutations that were actually not associated with significant uh, um, resistance uh, to particularly to dolutegravir. And whatever happens with dolutegravir also applies to bitegravir. So, and, and also at the same time, very low amounts of pre-existing resistance to other to NRTIs, which would be the backbone of the, of the regimens we're using. Here you see the evolution in three different time, point, uh, time periods, 2012, 13, and 2014, and 2015 onwards. And you can see that uh, for all these uh, uh, RT mutations, uh, the prevalence of, of pre-existing mutations is very low. And in this thicker line, thicker blue line, I'm highlighting M184V, and also M184V remains always below 1% prevalence. And actually it has decreased in Spain down to 0.35%. Um, uh, percent. So we should not be uh, really worried about resistance to the backbone, except in specific uh, situations that I will uh, touch upon afterwards. Well, one could say, well, maybe there are mutations in minority variants. So in this study that we also published uh, recently in, in, this is also a Spanish wide study that we published in JAC. We also applied uh, for uh, uh, Illumina sequencing. And what we could observe was also that uh, a very low, uh, very infrequent detection of resistance mutations, even at minority variants. In any case, uh, I mean, uh, such resistance mutations were very infrequent and they were not significantly affecting the GSS calculations to a different, <coughs> excuse me, to a different STI regimens, only to dolutegravir 3 tc but essentially because this drug counts as a, uh, formally as a GSS of two. So no pre-existing resistance mutations or very rare pre-existing resistance mutations. What happened to those patients that unfortunately had some resistance mutations detected? Uh, in, in few words, essentially nothing. They all suppressed therapy, suppressed their viral replication on uh, therapy and remained undetectable during follow-up. So no, regardless of uh, which mutations, they were uh, were being evaluated. So in a sense, very infrequent resistance detection and also no uh, cl significant clinical effects on, on pre-existing resistance. To instance, sorry. Okay, so one could say, well, maybe there's no resistance now, but resistance will evolve. And the answer is yes, it will evolve probably, but at what, uh, at, at what speed? And this, um, work from uh, the Swiss HIV cohort, you can see uh, what was the viral load, the population viral load after first exposure to different specific drug classes to STIs and NRTIs and boosted PIs or, PI, or boosted PIs, and also after virological failure. So what you can see here, for example, is whereas with the boosted PIs, boosted PIs started to be prescribed in 1996, approximately, slightly earlier in some places. So essentially over the years, you could see that the population viral load increased, both in people who failed therapy, but also after first exposure to the drug class. And these population uh, served as the origin of, were the possible transmitters of, of resistance. So if this population is reduced, then there are less people who are susceptible to transmit. And this is what happened with NNRTIs, but more so with INSTIs. So even with the first generation INSTIs, there is very few people who develop a detectable viral load in the presence of, of, of while taking INSTIs. And therefore, if there's no viral load, there's very little chance that these people will develop resistance. And if they don't develop resistance, they will not transmit resistance to the other population. So 
yes, uh, resi pre-existing resistance will evolve or might evolve, but it will evolve very slowly, and we should not expect uh, an STI resistance crisis in the coming in the coming years. A particular situation, which is not at all, uh, it's not at all uh, clinical practice, but but some people might try, is uh, dolutegravir monotherapy. It was tried in, in different clinical trials, and uh, there are different uh, slides. I could have chosen several different slides, but this is the summary. Uh, under dolutegravir monotherapy, people do fail, and when they fail, it is interesting that they fail with patterns that are uh, really uh, overlapping with uh, raltegravir resistance. So there's nothing special about dolutegravir in terms of resistance. When uh, resistance to dolutegravir develops, it develops through classical pathways. Um, uh, the point here is that uh, when we give dolutegravir, when we, we give dolutegravir uh, in combination with other um, um, drugs, it is very unlikely that resistance will emerge. Same thing with, with, with big tegravir. This is an example, a clinical case in a uh, from a patient uh, uh, from our hospital who was uh, put on dolutegravir monotherapy 10 years after being on an NNRTI-3 drug antiretroviral regimen. He was receiving efavirenz first and then nevirapine. He remained absolutely undetectable while he was receiving these low genetic barrier drugs, but then he was switched to dolutegravir monotherapy, and you can see here how fast he developed virological failure. So therefore, a conclusion is that do not use, never in your life, never uh, dolutegravir uh, monotherapy, uh, because also this failure was associated with selection of uh, resistance mutations like 155H and 148G. So what about dolutegravir 3TC? So all the data on dolutegravir 3TC is very positive. The results are amazing from the clinical trials, both in treatment naives and in switch. Uh, but what happens? Can we uh, use, can we prescribe dolutegravir 3TC to patients without uh, previous uh, resistance testing? So what we should worry is not about pre-existing STI resistance mutations. We should worry about the presence of M184V. So is it frequent? We have seen in the Spanish uh, analysis that uh, M184V was very infrequent. And this is another study from uh, um, 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 uh, an Italian group looking at uh, many, a lot of patients from different subtypes. And to make a long story short, M184V is very infrequent. However, there is one situation where M184V might be more frequent, which is in people who have been exposed to PrEP and despite being exposed to PrEP, unfortunately, uh, they uh, become infected. Uh, this is a minority. This is a very, uh, this is, it is rare. So the, uh, the, this message is not going against PrEP. PrEP is actually very effective, but if unfortunately you become infected while taking uh, PrEP with uh, tenofovir uh, FTC, for example, there is a significant chance that uh, M184V might be selected. So and uh, because PrEP is so often, so frequently used, we need to, to consider that. So our, when we choose about uh, the first antiretroviral choice, if we suspect uh, pre-existing pre M184V, the question is, do we have dolutegravir or bicterovir available for first-line heart? If it is available, if they are available, then we mainly worry about M184V. We don't worry about INSTI resistance. If it's not uh, present, then we worry about NNRTI, drug resistant mutations, and M184V that serves mostly for resource limiting settings. So, to I would let me finish by by showing you what the uh, resistance uh, guidelines what guidelines say about this. So in the 2018 uh, um, resistance uh, guidelines group uh, recommended uh, uh, did not recommend routine STI resistance testing in drug naive individuals. Uh, because of what I told you, there's no STI resistance transmitted, so we don't need to know that there is no resistance. Uh, however, baseline STI resistance might be recommended in, in selected patients if there's evidence of TDR, so uh, or TDR such as those with NRTIs or multi-class resistance. Monitoring of TDR, PDR to STI in selected sites in resource rich and L LMC settings is also recommended. Uh, do we care about minority variants? And the answer is no. Uh, both NGS and Sanger methods are equally useful. Drug resistance testing to detect minority variants is not recommended uh, outside research settings. And uh, in addition, NGS must report always like Sanger-like cutoffs, like 15%. We can uh, 
discuss that uh, more about that afterwards, but uh, optional, we can go down to 5% for NRTIs, but there is no evidence whatsoever that minority NSTI resistance uh, mutations matter for clinical management. And finally, the DHA says uh, antiretroviral guidelines uh, show these are the different regimens that are uh, recommended for most people with HIV. They all include uh, an NSTI, uh, which could be bitegravir or dolotegravir, and in some cases, raltegravir. And what I want to point out is that if you want to use dolotegravir 3 tisine you can, that's also recommended, except for individuals with high baseline viral loads or very high baseline vi viral loads, hepatitis B co-infection, or if antiretroviral therapy is to be started before resistance, before HIV genotypic resistance testing for reverse transcriptase. So uh, DHS guidelines recommend resistance testing. In summary, m one 4 v is the most frequent mutation involved in genetic barrier discussions nowadays. It is rare if it's spontaneous transmission. Up to 30% of new diagnoses in subjects with previous PrEP uh, may ha might have uh, m one 4 v so we need to be aware of that, particularly if we want to use deletegravir 3 tc uh, Dolotegravir and bitegravir have higher genetic barrier than raltegravir or alvitegravir, but they are not as high as boosted PIs. And we have seen that in the case that's uh, exemplified by the failure of dolotegravir monotherapy. And then dolotegravir 3DC can be used uh, as the first line only if there's a wild type virus, if there are more than 200 C4 counts, less than 500,000 viral load uh, copies. And, and you need to keep in mind that Gemini 1 and 2 studies exclude m one for v uh, subjects. As a switch, it's likely effective even in the presence of m one for v and only one case of uh, resistance emerg uh, emergence at failure. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed this talk.